This is an extract from Modern Railway Workings of 19, published in 1914 and it's the second in the series about signalling and uh, this section deals with lever frames. The levers for operating the signals and points are placed together at convenient centres and carried by either a 12 inch by 12 inch timber or a girder running longitudinally through the signal cabin. Some engineers prefer to place the levers so that a signalman stands with his back to the line when working the frame, a position which gives him a clear view of his work as there is nothing to obstruct the view. Others again, in fact the majority, place the levers so that the man faces the line when pulling. While there are a few who place them across the end of the cabin at right angles to the line, this is the minority. Opinion also differs on the question of centres of levers, these varying from 4 inch to 6 inches. The tendency in the past has been to space them at 5 inch or 6 inch centres, but with the increasing size of lever frames they are now almost universally placed at closer centres, thus affecting a great saving in the length of the cabin, a question of no mean importance where cost and the saving of room have to be considered. Another advantage in favour of the 4 inch spacing is that a new frame may be fixed in place of one at wider centres and containing a smaller number of levers without the necessity of extending the signal box to accommodate it. Another point upon which present practice differs from the past is in the position of the point and signal levers in the frame. In the past the levers working the up signals were placed at one end, the down signals at the other and those working points and facing point locks in the middle. The length of the lever tails also varied according to the movement required for the connection. Therefore if it were required to work a signal with a lever which had been uh, previously used uh, for points the tail would have to be lengthened in order to, to give the greater movement required. Lever frames are now made with all levers alike and drilled for point and signal connections. This allows the levers to be mixed up so that they may be placed just where most convenient. For instance, a lever for working a crossover road would have the signals applying to it in each direction, one on either side, in which positions they are most handy for the signalman as well as convenient for interlocking purposes. Types of catch handle locking frames. There are many different means of interlocking the levers, but as tappet locking is the type most used in up-to-date frames, the author will confine his remarks to this type. Interlocking may be divided into two kinds, that is preliminary locking and direct locking. In the former, the interlocking is affected by means of the catch handle and in the latter by the movement of the lever itself. The chief point of merit in locking frames of the catch handle type is that the locking is much more sensitive than direct locking. The mere intention of moving a lever as expressed by the signalman's grasp of the catch handle affects the necessary locking of conflicting levers before he actually pulls the lever itself. Then again in the case of direct lever locking which has been subjected to considerable wear the levers can sometimes be moved some distance without actuating the locking and the releasing of other levers affected before the lever has fully completed its travel. This is entirely obviated by means of preliminary locking, for it is absolutely essential that not only should the lever be exactly home, but that the catch must be down before the releasing is completed. The Saxby and Farmer's duplex pattern locking frame. The levers are mounted upon a turning shaft at four or four and a half inch centers as required. Each lever carries two tappets, one being connected to the lever direct and the other to the lever catch handle. The two tappets work in the same groove in the locking box, one sliding over the other, the locks being thick enough to engage with both tappets. The Evans and O'Donnell's locking frame the locking box in this case is placed at an angle of 60 degrees which makes it easier for inspection. The tappets are connected to the catch only and are actuated through the medium of rockers working on the lever shaft. Messrs Mackenzie and Holland manufacture 
the Dutton's frame. This was designed by Dutton and Company and is a distinct dis departure from the usual practice in that the lever centre comes as nearly as possible directly under the signalman's foot when he is in the act of pulling. This gives him a greater amount of purchase than is obtained by most frames in use. The locks are attached to the bars by means of screws and it is therefore an easy matter to remove a lock without taking the whole bar out. Some engineers object to the use of screws on the, on, on, on the score that they are liable to work loose. If however the tapper tap only is used, the screws will have to be driven home under effort owing to the bare thread and the locks will then hold as well as if they were riveted. The foregoing are the only frames used to any extent in which the locking is actuated by means of the catch handle. We may now turn our attention to direct lever locking which may be divided into two classes, that in which the tappet receives the full movement of the lever and that in which it only receives a small movement at the commencement and finish of the stroke of the lever through the medium of an escapement gear. At this point it would be as well perhaps to explain the object of keeping the movement of the tappet as low as possible. Suppose it should be required to place two locks in adjacent channels against the same tappet so that each should be released when the tappet was in the over position. It will be seen that if the stroke of the tappet is greater than the centres of the trough there is the possibility of lock A entering the notch B which was intended for B. Reference to, to the figure will make this clear. This difficulty is sometimes overcome by making the nose of the lock A larger than B and cutting the notches A and B to suit. Another method is to cut the notch B only halfway through the tappet, making the lock B to correspond. These methods however are not to be recommended as they necessitate so many different pattern locks being used that confusion follows and any oversight made by a locking fitter in cutting a notch too large or omitting to alter existing notches when fitting locking in adjacent channels may lead to serious consequences. Indeed, Another alternative is to fix the tappet near to the lever fulcrum, but the disadvantage of this is that the lock is not nearly so sensitive and owing to the purchase obtained by the long lever the locking is liable to be strained and even forced. We now come to the means adopted for reducing the travel by means of escapement gears and before proceeding we may consider the advantages and disadvantages. The chief claim is that the lock may be placed immediately under the floor plates and therefore at a much greater distance from the fulcrum than would otherwise be possible, thus obtaining a dead lock. Then again the locking boxes may be fixed in almost any position, either horizontal, vertical or at any angle. Against this it is subject it is urged that the increased number of wearing surfaces and pins tends to make the locking sloppy after being in use for some time. The standard lever frame used on the London North Western Railway is illustrated. It was designed by the late Mr Webb and like most of his inventions has entirely novel features. It will be noted that the usual catch handle is dispensed with and its place is taken by a stirrup placed in the front of the lever which upon being pulled down raises the catch block in the usual way. The locking boxes are fixed vertically and where a large number of troughs are required they are divided into two boxes and the tappets connected with a crossbar so that one lifts as the other drops thus equalizing the weight. The railway signal company's pattern is different. The tappets are attached to the levers direct the locking boxes being arranged in tiers so that any one tappet may be removed without disconnecting the whole of the locking on the lever. The London Brighton and South Coast Railway's standard frame is adapted from the Stevens pattern. Drop boxes which slide on the lever take the place of the usual spring catch rods. The levers are all centred on separate pins which makes it an easy matter to renew any which are worn. In the Mackenzie and Holland early pattern uh, frame, the tappets are actually by means of a cam which is carried on a turn shaft and operated at the commencement and finish of the lever's stroke by means of a stud fixed to the lever close under the floor plates. The locking is placed horizontally 
in one large box, provision being made for five bars in each channel, two underneath the tappet and three on top. A later frame of a novel type has been recently designed uh, by them. It will be noticed that there are two tappets attached to each lever and it therefore follows that the notches in both tappets coincide only when the lever is in its normal or reverse position. WR Sykes interlocking signal companies method uh, is applied to uh, London and Brighton and South Coast Railway frames. The gear consists of a fixed rack and a movable rack running side by side, the latter being connected to the tappet. A pinion which engages with both racks is carried on a pin attached to a box which slides on the lever to accommodate the radius of its movement. Two stops are placed on each uh, in such positions that they engage with the teeth of the pinion in the two extreme positions of the lever and consequently prevent the pinion from turning the rack being therefore drawn with the lever. The movement given is one inch at commencement and one inch at the finish of the lever's stroke. It should be mentioned that the teeth of the fixed rack are removed at each end to allow the wheel to slide. Sykes and Hallam Patents frame has a flat bar with two projections fixed to the lever in such a manner that the projections engage with two pins fixed into a disc the rotation of the disc imparting a downward movement to the tappet. Here again we have the locking placed at an angle. Arrangements are also made for adjusting the signal wires by means of a screw adjuster fixed in the floor plates between the levers. A, remo uh, a removal handle being used for this purpose. At sidings which are too far away from the cabin to be worked by it, a small ground frame is used and either controlled by means of a rod connection or an annette's key according to the distance. Gates are too heavy to be operated by means of a hand lever, although in the case of, of small gates it may be done, but a winch or crab is to be recommended for this purpose. Such crabs are preferably fixed at the end of the locking frame nearest to the, the level crossing so that the signalman can see that the roadway is clear whilst closing the gates. In cases where one, uh, where one cabin slots signals controlled by another cabin, uh, an individual should be fixed, an indicator should be fixed in the cabin behind the lever to which it refers. In most cases the arrangement is a mechanical one such as a disc or a slide appearing through an opening, but electrical indicators are now mostly used. The advantage of these being that they do not entail additional weight to the signal. It is sometimes necessary to provide an audible means of signalling between a ground frame and the cabin controlling it, so that the shunter may ask for permission to use the siding connection and give notice when he has finished his work by means of an arranged code upon a gong. The gong is usually worked by means of a wire connected with one of the levers in the ground frame. Whilst on the subject of ground frames, we may consider the method of controlling by means of an annet key. The lock is mounted either on the lever or at one end of the frame and interlocked with the lever. One key only is supplied and it is arranged that all conflicting signals must be placed at danger before the key may be turned in the lock. It is now carried to the ground frame and placed in the lock there and when turned, it frees the levers controlling the siding connection. Of course, it follows that the key cannot be taken out of the lock until the levers have been restored to their normal position and the key returned in order to lock the